Hi guys, welcome back to the Improvement Season podcast. I am Steve Hall and I am with Pascal Floor. Hopefully this time round, we do not get any freezing going on. <laughs> um, so last time we just spoke about uh, enjoying your cat theories to why there are so many cats in Greece. And Pascal was just going over his yeah, next plans uh, with his diet. So I'll let you go, yeah. Pascal. It's a little bit frustrating, right? When you have to repeat yourself that shortly again. Yeah. <laughs> like, because we recorded that one and then it froze up. And yeah, now, um, so where was I? Where was I? Um, second week of the new mesocycle is about to start. And I'm sitting at around 85 kilograms right now. Had some lower wash weigh-ins in the 84s already, which is really, really cool to see because it's been a long time ever since I've been there. And um, yeah, I will taper it down though. And I considered doing a diet break was something like a really short refeeding window. Didn't really feel the necessity for it though, but I planned on doing a 14 week cut. And so far I had no refeeds. I had, I was sticking to the plan, um, being in a caloric deficit for all the time. Everything is running smoothly, but I mean, when it comes to a diet break, you don't want to take it when it's necessary. You want to take it as a preventive measure. And especially when you're dieting 14 weeks. And do you really want to diet 14 weeks straight? Right now, I'm, I don't know because there's a momentum going on and I don't want to disrupt it. But I also know that it might be a good thing to have at least a couple of days where I'm at around maintenance to then push it for the latter half of that cutting phase. But I don't know. Well, what do you think about that, Steve? Yeah, I mean, my experience with um, diet breaks and things, I I know we have different opinions on this a little bit because I like to use them a little bit more frequently than you do. And I've seen really positive response with clients, whereas you've kind of seen mm -hmm. the opposite. Um, so I don't know if we're applying them maybe differently i'm not sure but um yeah I, I like taking them in combination quite often with a deload so for 14 weeks i for sure think like next i, I don't know when you plan to do it but i like combining them with a deload although yeah. the calories aren't quite as high when you're in that position because obviously you're training less but it, it's still a nice break yeah right now it's so i just started the new mesocycle so it will take me a, a couple of weeks still and then for the rest of the 14 weeks so uh, if i were to do it on a deal out i would only have four weeks left or of a cutting cycle so then the question comes up does it really matter whether i'm doing a diet break right now if then i would need to take it right now so in week two of the mesocycle maybe like halfway through my cutting phase and once again, I just want, don't want to disrupt any momentum, but this is the common misconception so many people make when they are cutting, like everything is running smoothly, right? And they don't want to stop that momentum. But if you don't take any kind of preventive measures, it could potentially be that you're then running into issues quite quickly, especially because of the fat, fat loss has been going quite well for me. And um, yeah, um, I don't know. I don't know. I have to really think about it, whether I want to implement one or whether I don't stick to 14 weeks or maybe just cut it to 13 weeks uh, or 12. I don't know. I have to say, I, I, I would like to stick to the plan because, I mean, this is what I've written out for myself and uh, it nicely keeps the contest prep next year in to consideration as well everything is laid out as i would like it to run um so yeah i really don't know yeah i think whenever i think about these sort of things especially when it's like a contest prep type plan if everything's going to plan then i would continue and go with it because yeah. um, that's that's always like you plan backwards and if everything's going how it should be then i wouldn't disrupt that momentum if that's got how it's like how you had planned it to be that's probably yeah. where i'd go with it and I, I didn't really set any kind of specific scale weight target for myself, but because it's running that smoothly right now and because I'm not even halfway through, I'm just playing with the thought of it would be nice to actually just go down to maybe 80 to 81 or 82 kilograms. I think that's absolutely feasible when I'm already sitting at around 85. Um, will I get there and stay there with my 
scale weight readings. I doubt that. This is why I would like to see at least with the cutting phase to hit the 80s. And then I probably bounce back to something like 82 kilograms because I don't know what is wrong with my body, but I tend to carry and hold on to so much water. And it's not uncommon to see when I'm loaded up on carbohydrates to see like two kilograms more on the scale. Yeah, I see that. I mean, yeah, I easily have five pounds, so I wouldn't like uh, two kilos. I'm not surprised about that really. Uh, um, what was I going to ask? Do you have a, because you're kind of doing the diet before the diet, mm. what is your kind of predicted, do you have a predicted stage weight for yourself and how much you want to get like, so you're in a shooting range of that? So uh, last last time or the last contest prep, the predicted stage weight was around like 68 kilograms. Okay. Um, this time around, I really do hope that I've made some significant progress in the off season so i would really like if it's above 70 kilograms um that would be significant that'd be a lot yeah that <laughs> would that would be significant so i'm really not certain and that's also why i would like to actually come down to around 80 kilograms to get a little bit more of an idea of where i'm at already um did i do or did i make progress in the off season i'm quite certain about it because my body composition right now i like to think that i'm looking better at 85 kilograms that i have ever before but it's always hard because there has been such a long time frame in between and you yes you can always look back to pictures uh, but i'm i'm always in a new environment i don't know so um predicted stage weight would hopefully be um a little bit above 70 kilograms, but I'm not batting on that. I'm, I will more so take it as it comes. And especially when the contest prep is around, um, because many people, yeah, once again, I mean, they over uh, underestimate of how much body fat they are carrying. And for me, also on that note, I just want to come in as conditioned as possible. I don't want to leave any kind of doubt on the table. And... Because I've never been that lean and because I'm actually having um, some some stretch marks all over my body because of the past and they've never gone away, I don't know how my skin will look like when I'm when I'm really lean and if my leanness will show like in comparison to someone else who would have the same composition but with not loose skin. So um, yeah, all these factors of course are on my mind but no. uh, these are things i can't really predict beforehand yeah i think well just being five to ten kilos over stage weight as a starting point so you're kind of bodybuilding lean to start with yeah. that's a good place to be in and like totally. you said it's your first time so always edge on the side of caution and just yeah see how things go uh, and i think i have plenty of time then so if i'm able to get down to now 80 kilograms i think that's a really really good starting point to then start a contest prep in january which then takes up to september i don't have to lose weight on a on a really rapid pace i kind of already know where my body is at when it comes to calories i have built up some some good habits from that cut already so i'm i think i'm in a really really good position to start that contest prep um, without any kind of pressure and without any kind of stress that I need to make weight because I mean it's then nine months and it should be possible to lose like nine to ten kilograms in nine months well yeah you should be able to have some diet breaks in there so a decent yeah. amount of time of doing that um, yeah that will and when you're that lean those diet breaks like you're not taking one for quite a while right now I imagine when you're leaner your yeah. rationale is more frequently absolutely yeah and just on another note, the most optimal outcome would, of course, be to be ready before that. Yeah. Right. Eat my way into the show because you can't ever be ready too early. Yeah. I mean, yes, you can. If you're ready like a year before that, it might be detrimental, right? But no, that's not the case. So, yeah, that's what I'm kind of aiming for. And that's why I didn't change anything about my schedule. 
because this cut is going better than I expected myself. And if I were to get down to something like 80 kilograms, it is pretty close and it's still a pretty long contest prep for only losing that amount of weight. But of course, when you're in that position, why not start it? Because a gaining phase, I think it isn't really feasible or uh, justifiable in that instance. Rather get ready early and then, yeah, be ready there and maybe eat your way back into the show because it shows itself on the body. Yeah, I'm exactly the same in that perspective where people kind of, I have it with clients where they want to edge out as many masses before their contest prep. And I understand that, but when you're in shooting range of a show and there's a decision of, should I have one more massing phase or should I like side on the edge of caution, have one more cut? I'm always like, well, you can have have that extra cut. We're going to have more diet breaks, retain more lean tissue. How much are you really going to gain in one massing mesocycle? Not much. Lucky if you gain a pound. So... I think in, in that case, it's probably more, more so psychologically. Like, they yes. don't really want to start. <laughs> and also they want just to eat a little bit more, which is totally understandable. I mean, um, I think contest prep can be quite, I don't know, um, quite stressful just to think about it. Because especially when you have never gone through it, it's just like you see people maybe going down to, I don't know, 1700, 1800 calories, doing lots of cardio, being super committed to everything. And it can be, of course, quite daunting for you to look at that. And uh, if you then have the opportunity to have a higher caloric intake right before that, I think many people would rather choose that instead of starting the cutting phase already. It's like the same principles or mindset um, when it comes to something like, okay, I start my diet tomorrow. Yeah. So I better make sure to eat all the food there is today. Uh, And maybe that is kind of the same. Yeah. Maybe it is kind of the same mentality that the, the subconscious uh, decision is rather to go with a um, gaining phase for one mesocycle because it's just, it's just a nicer place to be in. And the only thing I do want to flag up to listeners is you're doing, you're kind of getting down to that 80 kilo mark roughly, and then you're holding for a period of time to allow building back yeah. up calories, reducing diet fatigue completely, um, having a bit of a maintenance phase to set yourself up for sex, uh, sex, for success. <laughs> yeah. I, I, prime I, you, I, primer. Yeah. Prime myself for sex. <laughs> I think um, now I'm 31 years old. I think there aren't really many years to come where I'm really primed for sex, so I better make sure to make it count now. <laughs> um, shall I go over my week? I think we did a good review of yours. No, no. <laughs> uh, I'm not in the mood for that. Let's let's continue talking about me. <laughs> I think that's way more. But no, please. Probably no Tell one wants to hear about what's happening with me anyway. It's pretty boring. Tell me a little bit about your, your week. So um, this week, it's really nice, actually. I expected hunger levels to increase, like, kind of every week. I expected them to be more and more, but they've just stayed the same. Like, I just got no... I get a bit hungry at times, but the, like, long, long-term long average is not hunger. So I think that is a, that's different to my last mini cup, which is quite interesting for me. And I guess it's just because I have pushed myself up to um, that higher area of my settling point. Uh, so I'm happy in that regard training for the most part has been pretty good Um, it's non-exciting training it's kind of low volumes not like pushing I'm just trying to hold on to kind of performance and things like that Um, it's a kind of a different mentality you have to have in a mini cut where you're just kind of holding on to what you've got because you can't really hope for much more when you're kind of aggressively pushing down Uh, so I had one poor push push session where basically I'm just learning every single time that I need to just be a bit more of a, an adult in my first week of my mesocycle mm. not push so hard because I, I I really struggle on I was talking to this with a client and I think it's really easy in terms of like reps and reserve and relative intensities it's very easy on squats on bench presses to over edge it because yeah. I, for some reason on pulling movements on my hamstring movements on leg presses machine presses even like you can edge out like extra reps and you kind of have more in you than you realize you have. Whereas on a squat or on a bench press, like if you've got one rep left, you probably have only one rep left. Like you kind of know. No, I, absolutely. I, just to chime in there very quickly, I 
I overshot my RERs on squats so often. It's so where I was just easy. Like, <laughs> like, I have three more reps in me, and then you're doing the next repetition, and it's already like, oh, like holy <laughs> shit, I'm dying right now, right? It's just like, I don't know. And even it differs so much from set to set. We were just talking off air about um, when I was doing like high repetitions with 170, um, the first set was already like, horrible in terms of fatigue accumulation and also what it the metabolic disruption in my legs and then i approached the second set and i already could feel that the doms are starting to happen on that second set of the day right and um, yeah so fatigue sets in quite quickly on these exercises as well yeah i find it just i mean for me my quads and my chest seem to my quads not as bad but my chest has a particular poor repeat of performance so if i get like a set of eight and i'm maintaining reps and reserve across the set i'm unlikely to get like eight 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 Mm. eight that's so rare for my chest whereas if i'm doing something like a pulling movement or something like that i'm better able at maintaining those reps i don't know if it's yeah i guess it's muscle fiber type um but yeah, there seems to be something about pulling movement. Like I don't ever worry that I'm going to miss a rep on a pull yeah. generally, but on a squat, on a bench, like I get nervous and I end up over edging. So yeah, one push session think, this week wasn't that great. Do you think that it might be due to the fact that it's so much easier to always just squeeze out one more pull due to the assistance of other muscle groups? I, I, also absolutely. Because you can easily use a little bit of momentum and talk yourself into believing that it was all right still yeah absolutely i think i i think so many people including myself are yeah full full for that and the only one it doesn't get me on and this is why they're even harder is like pull-ups because i know when i'm cheating on pull-ups so i find if i over edge on pull-ups which i quite often do as well which is the classic people who train hard like to try and leave three or even four reps in reserve. I don't think I've ever left four reps in reserve no. um, when I've actually tried to. It just doesn't ever happen. I'm just like, oh yeah, I could easily like I should that, I could do four more. So no, 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 I definitely couldn't. Um, which is just overcooking it. And obviously, it hasn't cost my progress too much. But that's something I've realised in mini cuts, particularly. I have to be careful of because the fatigue just accumulates so much quicker mm. each week when you're doing that. And uh, lots of my clients, that's something. They always like, I've had clients ask like top tips for a mini cuts. I'm like, just that first week, don't push yourself as hard as you think you normally do, especially because you're normally coming out of a mass phase. Yeah. And in a mass phase, you can kind of get away with kind of pushing a little bit too hard because you're just eating so much. As long as you're really focusing on recovery, you can get away with it. Kind of felt invisible. Invisible? <laughs> I said that on my funny <laughs> yeah. story on Instagram. Invincible. Um, yeah, I feel a bit invincible during a mass phase sometimes because yeah. I just have so much, but... Um, something I definitely think I've noticed is I think I store a fair amount of glycogen in my chest. Like mm-hmm. it puffs up in a mass phase. And I think that impacts my pressing quite abruptly during uh, when I'm depleted because mm-hmm. I just have nothing there. Um, so that's interesting. But apart from, yeah, training's kind of just coasting along. Diet's going fine. Um, scale weight hasn't really... The first week it kind of went how I thought it would go because I dropped five pounds after holiday. I thought I'd kind of gain that five pounds back but I also was in a deficit, so kind of lost and gained, so it equaled itself out. So I kind yeah. of maintained that first week. This week on average, I'm down about a pound, um, but it keeps kind of going up and down. And the same thing happened my last mini cut. I didn't really lose as much weight as what you'd predict given my mm-hmm. calorie deficit. So I'm in like a thousand calorie deficit, you two pounds a week, but um, I'm not seeing that. But I think my third week, I think next week will be more, you'll see it more. And I think the week after that, assuming I do four weeks, which I think I should, um, I think it will be more, it will come down more, especially because next week, and the listeners will realize we're recording two episodes, I'm imbued for a wedding from Wednesday and back on Monday. So there'll be a lot of not having a scale to weigh in on, so I won't see anything, but I think that weigh in on the Tuesday morning will be light because I imagine my fiber and food volume will be a lot less because, yeah, my fiber during... Uh, my mass phase was like 30, 40 grams, which isn't that much. Um, mm-hmm. Sometimes like, closer to 40 and now it's like 60 plus. <laughs> so my five is definitely higher. Crazy. Um, just because I'm not training twice per day. I can have much more vegetables with meals. Yeah, totally. 
And I prefer to just have those and not feel hungry than think, oh, I'm going to keep my fiber low because it's going to help my scale weight come down. I, it's so crazy that you actually brought that up because when I was doing my maintenance phase and also gaining phase, I I think I struggled with getting in a sufficient amount of fiber intake. And now I would say it's it's significantly higher with a significantly lower caloric intake yeah. simply because I'm I'm choosing I wouldn't say better but probably it is uh, better food choices in that regard because I'm implementing more vegetables more fruits and um yeah picking better choices overall instead of just chunking down the calories in total I, I don't know my my intuition would say that this probably still has an impact on your overall body composition. Um, even if we know from uh, scientific literature that flexible dieting is absolutely feasible and shouldn't really have any kind of negative impacts or so or less beneficial impacts on your overall body composition. But it's just my intuition that says that probably whole foods – less produced and stuff like that is probably better for your overall outcome but i could be totally wrong and it's it's once again it's just my intuition that could definitely trick me into that but i mean clean bulking just eat all the clean food you just yeah. gain muscle and nothing else that's literally what i used to think i was like you can only gain fat if i eat processed food you can't gain fat if you're eating chicken yeah. and rice <laughs> or i don't know oats uh but yeah i mean i think I think it's it's easier to get away with on a when you're on higher calories to not eat that many like nutrient dense foods because mm. you're making up for it with quantity uh, whereas when you haven't got that quantity when you are cutting you need the quality there so everything oh. I'm trying to consume I might have I have actually had um even like I'm getting away with having like half a tub of halo top which is like 160 calories or like a little fiber one bar which is like 100 mm. calories I can't quite get away with just like, yeah, I can't go full like flexible dieting apart from maybe on my rest day because I'm less concerned about kind of making sure I'm having meals at particular times and nutrient timings, just less of an important thing on my rest on, on rest days, apart from obviously protein feedings through the day. So wow. I did manage to actually have a pizza with Charlotte, which is kind of unplanned, um, kind of ate a protein shake at like 8 a.m. in the morning. Mm. And then it was like 3 p.m. by the time we ate which like right. i don't even know where the time went mm -hmm. i don't like I, I don't purposely leave that amount of gap i normally would try and have a protein feeding and it just happened so i was like we went to a restaurant that does like smaller pizzas uh was it prezzo <laughs> so they're like under 500 calories i think they're like 400 oh. calories with a side wow. salad and they're actually decent and charlotte had one of those and i was like I've already eaten 300 calories. <laughs> I'm going to have a whole pizza here. Yeah. So then I just had like my typical like 1,000 calorie pizza. So um, they're Basically not... what I... Oh, sorry. sorry. I was just going to say, they're not the nicest pizzas. They're not like yeah. Neapolitan. So they're okay. But... Basically what I did in Venice as well oh, yeah. uh, was in the morning. So we got up at 4.30 in the morning and had my protein shake. And until... What was it again? I think up until... 12 or 1 I didn't have anything to eat and then we uh, went to that pizza place and I just had a big pizza because I thought that yeah so I skipped kind of breakfast and now I have breakfast and lunch at the same time so um, yeah sometimes when you're especially when you're busy and on the road it's so easy that time just Being flies busy. by and you're not in your daily schedule or routine because I know for a fact that Gradlin kicks in quite severely when I'm at home when, uh, yeah, I, I'm just doing my typical robotic schedule that, all right, time. it's 12, it's eating time. And not really listening to my body, though. And actually, that's an interesting thing with the talking about ghrelin. Obviously, listeners probably know it's the hunger hormone, so it gets signaled and it kind of has its own circadian rhythm, so it gets mm. used to your eating schedule. So if you're trying to do like intermittent fasting for the first time, it can be really hard because you're having that constant pulse through the day. But I think there's a saying, at least in English, there is like hunger passes and that's what happens with ghrelin. So if you're busy and you're out and you get really hungry and then like half an hour later, you're like, oh, I'm not hungry anymore it's because the actual ghrelin comes 
back down uh, because you haven't kind of eaten um, and it will pulse back up. So there is, so you can kind of get used to changing your eating schedule and your kind of frequency if you wanted to. Um, but I don't think either of us are a big fan of intermittent fasting because of no. the the issue with not getting your maximal muscle protein synthesis from frequent protein <laughs> feedings. I, I, I mean, things. it... I think it really depends on how you or what you understand about that term. If it's more so in that common understanding of 16 to 8 um, feeding and fasting window, fasting and feeding window, um, I think it might be feasible for some people. And I don't have anything against that on myself. I know when I'm super busy, then I'm just making sure to have a protein shake or something. But that is technically speaking already breaking the fast, right? And in that sense, yes, I'm not the biggest fan of just going without anything for 16 hours and then just stuff your face. Um, but if it's more so, yeah, I'm not really hungry in the morning, get a protein shake in or a, just a small snack and that should be fine absolutely fine actually um it's technically speaking once again you're breaking the fast so you're you can't do any kind of intermittent fasting in that sense but for me it's still somehow intermittent fasting yeah uh, i i call it like a, a protein modified intermittent fast or something um, mm. that might be something a term someone has already used but that's yeah. how I tend to say it to clients when they're like what do you think of intermittent fasting Steve can I do this I'm like well yeah. let's consider this yeah. um, so I think we've recapped our stuff enough and actually there was a question from AJ Morris um, so at least one chance. of them at least and one I of don't them, know it yet so. no but one of them really related to what we were already talking about in terms of your contest prep so that's why I kind of wanted to bring it up now uh, because I think it might be one that takes you a while to answer okay. potentially i don't know um so let me find it so aj has asked what's pascal's main goals for next year is he competing to win or to gain initial experience <laughs> um i just feel like you've got a long-winded answer mate <laughs> yeah i'm just i'm just really trying to think uh, of how I, how i want to put it out there without sounding arrogant or anything like that because first and foremost i know my limitations and i know that i'm i'm not super genetically blessed i'm not the biggest guy um but also on another note whenever i've been an athlete I'm not even just an athlete. Everything in life, when I'm doing something, I want to be the fucking best in that. I know it's not always realistic. I know that time is, is a restriction as well. Um, because, I mean, for some things, you simply need to, have to work for ages to potentially be at a point where you could talk about being the best and also genetics play a role in that one as well especially when we are talking about uh, physical things but um yeah when i'm when i'm competing i fucking want to destroy my competition um that might sound a little bit aggressive might, might sound a little bit harsh especially also because i'm always preaching to my clients that i still want them to enjoy the entire process and uh, take as much away from it as possible that they don't need to be as i don't know too harsh on themselves but it's just my nature it's just who i am i can't half ass it if i go in there if i do it I can't step on stage and be like, oh, yeah, you, you left something in the tank because you, I don't know, had a couple of refits here and there, took it or didn't take it as serious as you should have done so throughout the contest prep. That is simply not my nature. I am all in or nothing in, in every aspect, whether it comes to relationships, whether it comes to my... Uh, own ambitions in life um, when I'm doing something I, I need to go all, all in otherwise I'm I'm unhappy immediately 
I don't think even if um, even if you're just doing it for experience, just because obviously that makes sense. That's that's useful. I mean, there was no no point at which when even as I was bringing Pascal onto the team that I was like, Pascal, you have to compete to be a coach. There was nothing of that. I I did. I remember asking if you were planning to, and you you always said you were, which is cool. So it's never a case of Pascal's doing this just for experience. Um, there's always, I, I guess it's a selfish drive to want to do it, but that experience is also helpful. And I think if you weren't going there and doing it as if you were putting your all in, I don't think you'd get the experience from it that you would want. You want to yeah. experience having to do everything and yeah. putting your best. Yeah, absolutely. And um, just wanted to say something about um, getting in there with the experience. That is always always something that is there you can't do something and not gain any kind of experience out of it right even if you're trying to not be there with your mind you'd still take something away right so it is basically when you decide to do something like that you will still earn some or gain some experience along the way but it wasn't necessary because of that or because of my coaching skills to empathize a little bit more with clients or something. That's not primarily why I want to do it. Um, I want to take it from a competitive stance. I want to get on stage. And this is also why I'm actually plan, planning the next co- or the, the competition season as I've done it right now, because I don't want to fall into that situation where I've been like last year. I, I fucking don't want to fail. I, um, sorry for the language, but that is how I feel. There's no point. But no, let me let me put it this way. Um, for me, I I simply don't want to be in a situation where I feel once again as a failure because that is simply not what I usually do in life. If there's something I achieved, if there's something I did, I always want to come to an end and then I can still uh, reevaluate whether I did give it my all or not. Just as an example, with evening school, the last six months, I didn't really take it as serious as I could have taken it and probably the results... um, showed itself or the, the, the results were the reflection of what I've done over the past six months because I never had the ambitions to get a 1.0 which is the highest result but I wanted to get close to it right and then I ended up with having 1.4 which is still really really good but when I looked at it I was like ah, fuck it. yeah you could have probably done better here right but there was an explanation for it. I can actually look at the data and say, okay, this was your own fault. This was basically your own decision to not invest as much into that. And I don't want to be in that situation when it comes to the contest prep. Also, maybe, I'm not entirely certain about it yet, could potentially play a role, but because I want to be a role model somehow, not just for for uh, my clients, but also for other people who are just following us. And because we unfortunately also live in an industry or work in an industry where people are attracted by that. And I see it from a business standpoint as well. And I want to go or get to stage level leanness where people are a little bit afraid and a little bit shocked by it. But then it causes a little bit more of attention to be honest this Mm -hmm. is of course a byproduct of it it's not the primary driver for me to get on stage but i want at least to be on stage to sum it up to be on stage for primarily my own purposes as a competitive athlete be there on stage be really proud with what i've achieved really happy with the conditioning i've brought and then all the byproducts that come along with that, like experience, business-wise, self-promoting, all that kind of stuff as well. Yeah, I think it's that's the right angle to take at it because you have to do it for yourself first of all. I think if ever people are thinking to compete 
for like just business. Yeah. Um, I think that's just a you're just that's the wrong the wrong way to go about things because as soon as you have an option to screw up, you're like you go to your why oh, I'm doing this for business. It's like oh business is going okay. I'll just oh. have this extra cookie. Whereas if you're doing it all for yourself, then that's that's a great position to come at it from. I wonder if you'll struggle with something I struggled with during my prep was times at which and bodybuilders are like this where we often think harder is better. So I had times mm. at which during my um, prep where I, I wanted to do everything I could to bring my absolute best to stage. And sometimes the answer isn't just push yourself harder. Sometimes it is actually don't take calories further down. Do take a diet break here. That's something I mentally struggled with a lot because I just want to like run myself into the ground. And I think no. that's the way to go because to me that means better, but it, it totally isn't. Um, so I think that might be something that you end up struggling with just because I know you, what you're like and I know we're both very similar in that sense. Yeah. Uh, I, I, <laughs> this is something I expect is about to happen as well. And to be honest, I'm a little bit afraid of that. Not in the sense of my limits, my physical and psychological limits and doing myself harm, but more so the people around me yeah. and also what I've built so far in life. So in regards to Revive, for example, but also together with Katie and Hugo, um, that they are suffering because of the decisions I've made for myself and because of my stubbornness that I'm, I tend to forget what is really important. And I always try because I, I really do admire Jacob. So Jacob Scappers for that that he always said that his family and his business come first. And if the contest prep negatively affects these areas in his life, he will pull the plug. And I really do hope that I have the same mentality about it. Um, I really, so the last thing I want is that Revive suffers because of my decisions, because of my stubbornness, and especially also not Katie and Hugo, because they are the last ones who who should suffer from it and they don't really understand especially not hugo he, i mean he's two years old right he has no fucking idea about it and he doesn't understand where, why i'm grumpy maybe why i'm moody um and i'm easily attracted to having a tunnel vision because that's just the way i tick and if I have a goal in mind, my ambitions conflict with other things in life many, many times, many times. And I'm willing to sacrifice a lot of other things to actually get to my goal, which is not, necess not necessarily a good thing because I'm also willing to sacrifice like personal relationships for that. And that's nothing I'm saying to because I'm proud of that, but it's more so something I'm aware of myself because it happened in the past. Um, I have high ambitions for myself. I want to actually always get towards my goals. And it is so easy then on that path to forget about other things that are important in life as well. And it's, I'm really afraid of me getting so much in a, into a tunnel vision that I'm forgetting about the other important things that are truly important and not just the, the, the short-term goal of gratification on staying on stage. Yeah, I think it's, it's something you see, unfortunately, quite regularly is that people, I, I've heard of people breaking up because of contest prep. I know for my first show, Charlotte held, held with me through that mm. and I didn't realize it was as bad as what it was at the time because it was quite bad. Fortunately, you're in a much better position with Katie in that you can already have had that discussion. You can make her aware. You're very yeah. aware of what can happen. I was very ignorant to it. And so Charlotte was even more ignorant to it um, and didn't understand. Whereas if you make people in your life understand, I think it's much better. But I, yeah, I, my 2014 was the example that you said. I closed people out. I was grumpy and I isolated myself in a very negative way. Um, even like colleagues, when I was working, I was a, a PT in the, in the, my local gym and colleagues were like, after my show, they're like, Steve, you're completely different. I thought you didn't like, even like me. Uh, and I'm like, no, I, 
I guess I just didn't have any energy to talk to you because <laughs> I literally would close people out. Uh, and my if I was relying on solely one-on-one PT for my income, I would have like suffered financially because I was hoping clients wouldn't turn up for sessions, things like this really was bad. But on the other hand, and as like a hopefully kind of silver lining or not silver lining, but like bright line for you, my 2000, like last year's prep with Charlotte and with everyone, as far as I'm aware, and you can tell me about if Revive suffered particularly, but I think the podcast still got done, client work still got done. Totally. Um, clients noticed that I wasn't as energetic, but they still got their updates. And Charlotte actually said like the whole experience really wasn't a negative one, yeah. um, which I was so worried about. And then in fact, strangely, that was my overriding goal of this comp prep was to actually make sure I did it and not affect Charlotte in a negative way. Right. So I definitely think with the tools that we've got at our disposal and kind of the planning ahead that you've done, I think you'll be in a really good position for it. I think it will be hard though, because obviously if people don't know, you're, go, you're now at school again, um, or not even school, you're at university. University. So a step yeah. up. Obviously, we yeah. have ambitions for Revive. You've got Katie and Hugo in your life. And I think some of those things, like having Katie and Hugo there, they're going to help a lot, but there yeah. will be times at which it will make it hard. Yeah, so two things I just want to touch on really quickly. I think that when it comes to your contest prep, the relationship and the outcome that you had then after that contest prep with Charlotte is just reflective on how successful your contest prep was for for yourself, but also for, for your environment. And I always like to say that your contest prep was like role model contest prep, right? You primed yourself before that, put yourself in a good position, and you didn't let the contest prep affect your life at all. At all, right? But the, um, so on, on another note, the second thing I just wanted to point out is, so on social media, everything is, perf- uh, is presented as perfect. People don't know and appreciate what good is anymore because perfect became, became the new normal, basically, right? And because of that, I see every once in a while like competitors who make it to stage who have a lot of things going on in their lives themselves who are maybe also family um, so so fathers they are running their own business they are maybe I don't know professors as well or researchers or still going to university on the side as well and I see that right and I take that as the standard from myself but this is so wrong and I know it, I know it, right? I, I shouldn't compare myself to these individuals could, because it could potentially turn out that this isn't something I can do because maybe I need, I don't know, eight to 10 hours of sleep to function well, to make everything happen. Um, some people only need the six hours, right? And maybe I need every once in a while a little bit of downtime or time together with Katie and Hugo and stuff. And time is just a limited resource. And maybe I'm not capable of doing everything at once. I still want to try it though. But I also need to be realistic and rational with myself that there probably comes a point in the contest prep where it's getting hard and where I, when it comes to that point where I then have to reevaluate whether it is negatively impacting university, the family, and also the business, because these three things are way more important than stepping on stage. And I also know that other people are able to do that and pull it off, but Potentially, I'm not. And there's no shame in that. This is something I still keep myself uh, or keep keep repeating myself because I tend to forget it, that I'm not these individuals and it might be different for me and it might turn out that I simply can't pull it off when I'm having all these other things in life running at the same time. Yeah, I think that's a massively important point for lots of the listeners is, and what I really liked is we we actually do set the standard as the perfection that gets portrayed on social media because it's not even that, okay, so people with better physiques who are doing better are more likely to share 
And then those are more likely to be seen as well. So even when people who don't maybe win or they don't have the best physiques, they're still not even more likely to be in your feed. They're not going to get the same amount of attention. So we don't see those. And so we do set ourselves kind of up and standards that are probably inappropriate a lot of the time, especially because most people are average, but you don't see most people. You don't see the average, you see above average always. And if you set that as a standard for yourself and you are average, which most people are, you, most people are going to be disappointed, <laughs> which is really sad, but it's the, the uh, truth. Uh. So I think this has been a really productive discussion. I don't know if there's anything else you want to add, if we want to maybe cap this episode here and get onto some questions for the next one. Well, I mean, I just wanted to say thank you very much to AJ for that interesting question, because it also is always good to talk about it openly um so because i'm under the opinion that people are really bad at thinking but they are good at speaking and this is also the reason why i think that something like client check-ins in a video format is really good for the clients themselves because once they talk about what is going on in their life what has happened like last week most of the time they come to a conclusion themselves and find the, the solution for maybe a potential problem themselves. And for me now this year, this discussion was once again reminding me of potential things to come, potential barriers, things I need to look out for and be prepared for. And um, yeah, just thank you very much, AJ, for that really, really interesting question and the psychology hour that we just held here. Yeah, I love, I actually really like questions because they make me realize I know stuff. And also I like thinking things out. So um, just yeah. to add on what you said, like voice notes or even with some clients and their response, I'll be thinking through things and like responding. I'm like, oh, hang on. Like I've come to the, like, the solution here with just thinking through it via speaking. So no, I definitely agree with that. And yeah, brilliant ending. And uh, we'll catch you guys soon, I guess. Cheers, guys.